Good evening. Hello and welcome to the Marian Minor Cook at the NAM. I am Ave Vasquez, one of your app fellows for this year. As Thanksgiving break and midterms and finals approach, you may find yourself preparing for a long drive or a short one to take your mind off of things, if just for a moment. Picture it. You're in the car, probably feeling awful about gas prices, uh, so to take your focus off of that and the million and a half other things you have on your mind on the daily, you turn on the radio, scroll through a series of ads and static, and eventually settle on a voice. What starts off as background noise to your drive leaves you enthralled. There's no music, but there's a melody to the words. You're left with an experience that ranges from, huh, you learn something new every day, to genuinely being more informed about a given topic. Tonight's speaker, radio host Larry Mantle, has given audiences this experience for nearly 40 years. He hosts AirTalk, a part of NPR member station's KPCC's programming. It is the longest running daily radio show in Southern California. Mr. Mantle has featured a variety of figures on his program, covering topics such as politics, entertainment, science, history, and many more. For his contributions, Larry has been recognized as the Radio TV News Association of Southern California Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019, the Radio Journalist of the Year from the Los Angeles Press Club in 2012, the Mark Twain Award from the Associated Press in 2013, and the Journalist of the Year from the Society of Professional Journalists in 2010. Tonight, he will share with us his thoughts and experience regarding the evolution of radio, of talk radio, and its continued importance in today's conversations. Before welcoming Mr. Mantle, we will review some guidelines and rules at the AF. Uh, per the college's health and safety guidelines, we ask that audience members wear a mask when not actively eating and drinking, uh, we recommend. Uh, we remind the audience that video and audio recording are strictly prohibited and suggested phones are silenced or, turned away, or put away. Um, at the end of tonight's presentation, there will be some time for questions and answers. Mr. Mantle's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Dryer Roundtable, whose mission it is to inspire public service at CMC. Visiting lecturer of international journalism, Terrell Jones, will moderate tonight's conversation. Without further ado, please welcome to the AF, Larry Mantle. So happy to see people here. Before we start, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, Larry Mantle's wife, uh, Kristen, uh, is here. And uh, his son, Desmond, uh, class of 23. <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> uh, it's an occasion to uh, note that this makes me feel old because I was once on Larry Mantle's show uh, as a guest when I was a re reporter for the LA Times in uh, Detroit. And um, it was uh, in the year 2000 before Desmond was born, even. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, um, I want to start uh, with um, uh, an appropriate uh, lead-in, if I can, to, uh, to the show. Um, since you are the guest here, and this is the first time for you to speak. It's not your first time speaking at the AF, I think. It is, my, it is my first it, it is time first to speak time. here, okay. yeah. But I wanted to give it, me, uh, give it a proper um, start, so bear with me. <clears throat> here I go. <clears throat> Good evening, and welcome to Ath Talk, not with Larry Mantle. <laughs> I'm not Larry Mantle, and thank you all for joining us. Our guest tonight is the Larry Mantle. And we'll be talking about his 37 years in talk radio. Larry Mantle, welcome to Ath Talk, not with Larry Mantle. It's a pleasure to be at Ath Talk. Thank you so much. And Terrell, I, I just have to say, this is, this is a real thrill for me to be here, uh, to, to have a chance to talk with so many of you. I love the conversation at the head table this evening and talking with others of you at the reception. Uh, I, I hear from our son how much he loves CMC and what an incredible experience this is. And every time I visit, 
the conversations I have with students and with the faculty and administration here, this is an amazing place. And I know so many of you appreciate what is offered here at, at CMC. But as an outsider coming to visit, I look forward to this opportunity. This is, this is a wonderful place. And it's devotion to free speech and the ath bringing in all the different speakers that you do with such a wide range of different perspectives. Uh, it's just, it, it's as higher education should be. Um, well, I wanted to start maybe with a little bit at the beginning because it's kind of remarkable. You've been doing this show for 37 years, but you started this show just six years out of college. Yeah. So what was that trajectory? How did you get to where you are so early? Well, KPCC was a little boutique tiny station when I started. I would have never had the opportunity to do what I did. Uh, if it wasn't that way, the station that KPCC is now, with all of its transmitters across Southern California, its own digital news site, LAist, its own podcasting studios, none of that existed. There were five full-time employees. So me as a young person coming out of college with a love for radio, I was able to learn on the job. I had that luxury because of the small size of the audience the small footprint that KPCC had, and that time when commercial talk radio really dominated, a time when, when all the markets across the United States, even mid-sized and some small towns, had a local host who was doing a show very similar to what I do now, but at that time it was commercial radio that dominated. So I was able to get a start and see KPCC over a period of decades grow into what it is now, I would have never dreamed that the little station that I started with would now have an editorial staff of more than 100 people. We had five employees total, and now we have an editorial staff, editors, producers, reporters, hosts of, of about 100 people. So it's just, it's just changed dramatically. My biggest fear, though, Terrell, was when I started, I was so young, would listeners pay attention to someone so young talking about you know, major issues like education policy, like abortion rights, talking about the latest in, in science in an in-depth way. But the audience was very forgiving and it built over time and I learned as I went and uh, I would have never dreamed all these years later that I, I'd be the same place and see it grow to what it is. Did you have in your mind then tailoring your shows and topics to the audience at that time? Yeah, definitely. Uh, because just like now, is very much a college educated or equivalent. I use that term as a stand in for autodidacts and people who have life experience that give them that equivalent or the curiosity that really makes for the kind of listener that we have. But generally, these are people who are lifelong learners. And I, I know that they come to any segment that I do, there's a subsection of the audience that knows far more about it than I do. So I knew right away, I, I, you know, I can't be the expert, but I have to be well enough prepared to be able to not start at the very beginning because that's not gonna be of interest for people who have some degree of working knowledge of a topic. I need to start farther down that road. And over time, I, I, I think I found that sweet spot of how much depth to go for, how much to assume that the audience knows and not, and, and to try and, and find that way of speaking directly to the type of listener that we have. What did the radio landscape look like in 1985? Uh, was, were you entering what you would call a crowded field? Or yeah, really. I mean, in the talk radio sort of realm? Talk, as a, you know, and, and as I was saying before, there were all these local talk shows, and at the time, L.A. had a bunch of these star talk show hosts making a lot of money, and they were doing shows, some of which were kind of straight down the middle, but over time, they started to polarize, become either highly conservative or more liberal, and, and so I was introduced into this field at a time when public radio had very few listeners. So I was kind of a blip on the ratings. I mean, I, I, when I started, but the people that listened were movers and shakers. They were members of the city council. 
They were college professors. They were people working in various industries at the forefront. They, so the influence of the program, even early on, because of the demographic, was significant. And then over time, because of consolidation in commercial radio, where you had large media companies like iHeartMedia or Cumulus Media, they bought up everything. And so they ended up with hundreds of stations across the country and huge debt loads that they amassed in those acquisitions. Well, the only way that they could service the debt was to take their star folks and syndicate them so that every iHeart news talk station in every market, large or small, that they owned would have the same lineup of guests heard around the country. And the local folks, like uh, Michael Jackson, not the singer, but Michael Jackson, the um, British radio talk show host in LA, who had a huge following uh, and who was a big influence on me, um, eventually it became too expensive to do shows like that. But public radio, because of direct listener support and no debt load, was able to build and build and build. And, and listeners, that influential audience that we started with, put the money up for us to grow and grow and grow. And so as commercial radio, and its listening is declining quite sharply, uh, went to this consolidation cookie cutter mold, we were able to do highly localized with NPR network programming, but also highly localized things and to make our mark in the ratings and with listeners. When you started out, did you look at the difference between there's AM and there's FM? Because a lot of the talk was on AM. I it was guessing. AM, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so was FM then, was it a appealing to you or was it because it was public radio? Um, what, what, how did you, you know, the band, where you wanted to go? Yeah, the band really didn't matter. The station I worked for before KPCC was an AM news talk CBS station in Riverside. And uh, I, I got a job, I just cold called them up because I knew a lot of people who worked in LA had worked at this station in Riverside. And I called and, and the woman who answered the phone said, oh, they just fired the news director today. Let me put the program director on. How soon can you get here? I, this is, you talk about luck. <laughs> I, and so I said, well, uh, you know, let me put a suit on, I'll be right out. I drove from Pasadena to Riverside as fast as I could. <laughs> and was, I did a cold read of Associated Press news copy, and it was probably the best read I have ever given in my life. If only I could read that well now. It was like the moment, you know, where the heavens, oh, and, and the program director said, come with me, and he takes me into the general manager's office. We need to hire this guy. And boy, like that, I had a job. I was unemployed, looking to find a, a job in radio. So it was AM. It was, uh, we had CBS News and, and talk radio programs, and I took over the afternoon drive time uh, period uh, with a man who became a very good friend of mine who later worked with me at, at KPCC, uh, the late Steve Julian. I met him there. We were co-anchors in the afternoon. But I didn't seek out FM. I, I, I sought out KPCC because it did the kind of in-depth programming that interested me. I'm not someone to go on and try and convince somebody to vote in a particular way. I'm not a highly partisan person. I like ideas. I like policies. I like debating them. I, I, like, I like the ath experience of get all the different voices and let people make up their own minds. I have no confidence of you know, how I would try and convince you of doing, uh, you know, taking any position. So no, and then AM radio, of course. How many people in the room ever listened to AM radio? More than I would have thought. And some young people, wow. <laughs> I'm impressed. That surprises me because AM listening is so on the decline. Um, and and you're, you're seeing even KNX, the uh, CBS, all news station in Los Angeles has now moved to FM as well because that's where the that's where the audience is for now uh, until it's all streaming. Yeah, I, uh, I interned at a AM radio station, KFWB. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. News ninety eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's one of the places back. they told me I shouldn't go into the business. It was a bad job. Yeah. It was KFWB. <laughs> yeah, it would have been a tough haul, I think. Um, Back then, then was that ecosystem you described of uh, you didn't want to be partisan, you didn't want to tell people how to vote one way or another, was that 
in the majority of the talk radio sort of landscape? No. Or minority, would you say? I at, would say, at the I time? Would, well, when I started, it was probably about a third was that sort of um, nonpartisan, bring all different sides together. And about two thirds were, at that time, a mix. You, you had like um, Elliot uh, Mintz, who was a, a, a liberal uh, talk show host in Los Angeles. Les Crane was another one. They had big audiences on commercial radio. And then, of course, you had conservatives like Joe Pine and who would tell listeners, go gargle with razor blades. I mean, that sort of very in-your-face kind of approach to radio. Uh, and and you know, so if you think things are caustic now, that was back in the 60s. But uh, it, it, over time, pushed out those kinds of, of bring all people together and really became preaching to the choir uh, radio. So was talk radio politically influential uh, to a great degree back then, so talking about 1985? Yeah, yeah, in fact, or Michael Jackson's, socially. which was one of those shows where he brought everybody in, had a hu huge effect. Politicians, because he had huge ratings, would want to come on his show, and if you were running for mayor of Los Angeles and you weren't on Michael Jackson's show, you were invisible. I mean, they, he had that kind of a platform. Um, presidents would come on the show, senators. This was really a place that set the pace for this city's conversation, particularly because people across the political spectrum could listen to it. And that's what, what I'm hopeful. You know, one of the nicest things is Michael Jackson said to me after he had retired later in his life, he said, I listen all the time. And he said, You're, you've created that civic voice. And that was deeply meaningful to me because I had grown up listening to him and admiring how he brought people together in our community. If you flash forward over those several decades to today, has talk radio, the role of it, developed in a more um, positive, influential way, would you say, or a more divisive, influential well, way? Well, I, th I think it's, it's created the echo chambers. If you look at Fox News, for example, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not making any qualitative judgment when I say this, it's essentially conservative talk radio in prime time. That's what Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, um, uh, Laura Ingram, they've, they've essentially taken the conservative talk radio approach, added video elements to it. They don't take listener calls, of course, but have created that kind of, of a conservative echo chamber as MSNBC has created a liberal echo chamber. And, and, and in their prime time, and, and even uh, some of the slots outside of it, um, reinforce people in the beliefs that they already have. And um, I think that's fine. You know, it's like comfort food. It's fine to a point. It's, there's nothing bad with being comforted and hearing like-minded people say things that you agree with or that um, emotionally connect with you. But if you're not exposing yourself to the things that are difficult for you to process or that make you angry or that don't make sense to you, you're never really going to progress in your thinking. And my concern is that people across the political spectrum are, are feel such a deep sense of emotion and that the stakes are so high that they've retreated to their safe space. And uh, I don't think staying there is healthy. How have the topics that you wanted to bring on the air and that the listeners wanted to hear evolved over the time that you've been doing this? Is there a lot of trial and error, Terrell? At the beginning, um, I was trying to think, well, here's the age demographic of the audience, here's the education level, what would they be interested in? And, and just kind of, you know, throw that against the wall, see what sticks. Over time, I heard from listeners what connected with them. What were the segments that they really, and a lot of times they were the lighter, they were not the intellectual segments, is asking, um, you know, what, what was your, your favorite old time LA restaurant that you went to? What's the thing that you miss most about that existed in the world when you were younger that's gone now? 
what um, what is um, well, the one you just did this this past week about the record album that resonated? Yeah, with you yeah, we did. Stuff? We we asked listeners, what is if there is one album that's so connected with you, it had a deep personal effect, comforting you or or changing your way of thinking about something, or musically opened up just a whole other. Uh, genre of music or type way of listening to music and the phone lines were just jammed we have 10 lines and they were just completely full of listeners with wonderful stories in both of those categories of of how it opened uh, up you know to, to what music could be and in other cases where the lyrics and performance just hit a deep emotional need in them and I love doing segments like that one of the segments I'm, I'm proudest of was one our producers had real concerns about me doing. Um, first of all, being a man and hosting this conversation. But this was maybe 10 years ago, and, and there was some news peg for uh, abortion rights at the time. And I took an entire hour and opened up the phone for women to call in who'd had abortions and to talk about that experience and how it affected them. The calls were unbelievable. The range of response, the ability to articulate such complex emotions or life events that were affected by that. I just came off the air and I, I just couldn't even talk after that hour. Um, I still get people who heard that hour who tell me about that was, I said, how did you even feel you could do that? And I said, I don't know. I just, it just, I felt like the audience would do this, would connect with it. And uh, it's kind of thing you, you wouldn't hear anywhere else. But it's, it's one of the hours that I'm, I'm proudest of. It's over time. You learn your audience. You learn what, what, you know, what degree of trust do they have in you? How much latitude do you have in dealing with certain topics? And... And if you're doing something heavily reliant on listener input, what quality of input are they going to get you? Because you don't want something binary. Do you think we should do this policy, yes or no? You want people's personal or analytical experiences that they can add to the conversation. And just to note that Larry's uh, shows are archived uh, online. If you just Google Larry Mantle Air Talk, uh, you can get to the page where all the shows going back to when? I, the archive, I think, goes back to 2000, I believe. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, so I might be able to find my appearance on there. Then. There's a good chance, Terrell, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. You see a little star next to it, particularly good yeah. guest, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, little blue check. There. Yeah. <laughs> right, yes, yeah, very good. Has, has your uh, audience evolved in terms of demographic, uh, either by age or ethnicity or politics? It's, I'd say that the age demo has stayed pretty consistent. We're, you know, heavily weighted to middle age. You know, people don't start listening to public radio generally unless they grew up on it and became fans growing up on it, but generally until they've been out of college for a few years and are, you know, buying a house for the first time, maybe have kids and are, you know, thinking about education policy in a very direct way, that's when they start listening. I have seen our audience grow more liberal over time. And uh, there's nothing I can do about that because so much has become polarized in our world. But I used to get wonderful calls from conservative listeners who, uh, you know, we'd get real ideological differences on the air. That's become much more difficult. And I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to think that, uh, th I hope I haven't played a role in that. Um, because I've certainly been encouraging of conservative listeners to share their perspectives. But I think public radio is now so perceived as a liberal medium. Uh, just, of, of course, is like film documentaries are, are, you know, perceived to be general. There are conservative documentaries, but, you know, 95% come from a liberal perspective. And uh, that's something... Everything has been great about the growth of KPCC. The audience is many times what it was. I'm typically talking to 40,000 people at a time. It's the biggest conversation in Southern California. 
just because of the number of people. There is no other place listeners can talk to each other in a group that large in Southern California. You'd have to have two, two uh, crypto.com arenas, Staples centers, to, to do that. And, uh, but I, I do miss that we are so polarized. You know, I'm someone who, I, I wanna hear from everybody. And I, I, I regret that fewer people seem to be okay with that. The biggest conversation in Southern California is a great way to uh, uh, describe and look at, uh, at your show. Um, I wanted to ask about how you decide what you're gonna talk about on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, you have some criteria that you feel must be met in order to make it to that level. Yeah, Terrell, there are three of them, one of which is it's happening right now. So uh, former President Trump's just announced he's running again for president. Or we have um, a school shooting that's happened that we need to cover. Or uh, you know, so it's election day. The second criteria is something really requires depth, something that it needs more time, and even on NPR's news magazines, isn't gonna get enough time to really get into the depth and complexity, the nuances of the topic. We can take as much time as we want. We have two hours a day. There's some, some uh, segments we'll do a full hour on a topic. We did a week-long prison series. I think two of the days, they were a full hour conversation. One was on solitary confinement, a full hour. And, and we didn't exhaust it even in a full hour on that topic. The third is that there is a personal listener story that they can share, something that really takes what's just um, conceptual and makes it lived, or that people have an analysis that with our very bright, plugged-in audience, that they're going to bring analysis that I and our expert guests would never think of. And that's the thing, with the audience that I get to talk with, as I said earlier, you know, any topic I do, a sizable percentage of the audience knows more about it than I do. There's that degree of expertise and knowledge in the listeners. So you know, I can't be the expert. I've just got to lead that conversation. But they have the ability to ask the great questions of the guests or to take it in another direction that I wouldn't necessarily know to go. That's an incredible gift. And our producers who come up with the topics also screen the listener calls. And they're pretty ruthless. You know, our philosophy is no one has a right to be on the air. This is not public access radio. The callers better be as good as a guest would be. Because otherwise, listeners aren't going to stay with the program and we're not serving the audience. And that's the whole reason for the show, is to serve the audience, not callers. So they've got to be good. They've got to be to the point. They've got to have interesting analysis or a relevant experience to share that enriches the conversation beyond what the guest or, or what I could say. So those are the three elements that going, go into it. And then our production staff, uh, four full-time producers, two news apprentices who are recently out of college pursuing, and it's a nine-month uh, apprenticeship where they jump right in and it's their first, you know, fully paid job in, in uh, radio journalism. And then we have uh, some interns a as well. And um, they all pitch, all of us pitch ideas. We get together, we go through the ideas. Some of them are be half-baked and we encourage that. Someone may come in and say, you know, I was looking at a billboard this morning and it made me think about, I was seeing a City of Hope billboard and then I was thinking about, well, it's a cancer center, but what do they mean when they say it's a comprehensive cancer center and who funds them? And then the next thing, we end up with a segment about uh, an aspect of healthcare, for example. So a lot of it is we build on each other's ideas. We take something half-baked and are able to um, come up with something collectively. The producers are extremely bright, very dedicated. They work so hard. And everybody's very bought in on the mission of, of what we're doing, which is to serve Cal uh, Southern Californians, help them with decisions they're making about voting, about you know, how, how to raise their families, uh, what their priorities are going to be, what they think about public policy. That's our, our mission, is to, is to help people with that. You have to come up with 10 hours of programming uh, a week nine hours of news and topics and one hour of film 
Yeah. Uh, I want to hear about that too. Um, but I just imagine such a frenetic pace of people just running around and like, you know, how do you pull it all together? I mean, just today, for example, your show uh, had guests uh, talking about Donald Trump's an announcement for uh, a third presidential run, uh, a stabbing that took place yesterday uh, in downtown Los Angeles, um, groundwater access, dual uh, uh, education. Dual uh, enrollment, dual yeah, enrollment, education, high school, high school and college. High yeah. school uh, students taking college, or combining the, the classes. Uh, and and LA sports teams, you know, the, the, I mean, it's like yeah. really all over the the map. What does a day in the life of the of Air Talk with Larry Mantle look like in terms of the pace and the energy and the chaos? <laughs> it's it's controlled chaos. So it's it you you wouldn't see people like flying around like a, a movie like Broadcast News where everybody's constantly frazzled and melting down. Uh, but you'd see a highly focused group of people on task. You know, we arrive at 7.15 in the morning. We have a very quick 15-minute meeting. We decide what are the holes yet to be booked in the show. Trump's announcement was, you know, what we booked into the lead today. That was what needed to be filled. And, and then the senior producer makes the assignments to the other producers of who they're going to pursue. We got Ron Elving, who's NPR's national political editor and uh, the dean of the graduate school uh, of, of politics, or public policy school, excuse me, at Pepperdine, because we're really talking about the challenge that Trump's president, uh, presidential run poses for the Republican Party. And Pete Peterson at Pepperdine is a Republican uh, and an academic, of course, and so I thought he would give an important perspective on how the party is, is, uh, is dealing with that. That was all booked 90 minutes, within 90 minutes of the start of the show. I go down to the studio, I do my final preparation. The news apprentices bring me material to study, which is pretty voluminous. One of the big advantages I have doing the program is I have very good short-term memory. So I'm able to load in a fair amount of information and recall it. Now don't ask me the next day what <laughs> about some factoid that I mentioned on the show as though I you know, said it like I really had deep knowledge of it. Uh, that was from the study I did in some cases an hour and a half prior. Other cases it's days before, but, but sometimes it's at the last minute if it's something that's brand new. And, and then uh, it's all hands on deck for the show. People come down. We have a beautiful studio, uh, floor to, to ceiling glass. I sit on one side with a table with microphones that are arrayed around it so I can have up to four guests with me at any time. On the other side is the technical director at the console handling all the audio, clips, anything else, any breaks that we have. And then behind her is the line producer, typically our senior producer, but it could be any producer, who's giving me feedback through um, the intercom, talking in my headset, or we have a software screening program that's on the screen in front of me where they can message me and let me know, uh, you know, Caller Paul on line two is particularly good or has a great story to share. And I can say, Paul from Claremont, uh, I understand that uh, you worked at one of these stores, you know, tell us about that experience. And, and then after the program, I do the promos for the next day's show to try and get listeners to come back the next day. And we then meet again and have our longer, about an hour long meeting, where we do longer term planning. We, everybody pitches ideas, some of which immediately, that's great, let's go do it. And the assignments are made. Other times it's that massaging process where we kick it around and, and, and sometimes disagree. And, and ultimately I have to feel comfortable with it I think to do a serviceable job of the topic, but um, generally there's consensus on what we do. You you say that you read very quickly material that's prepped for you that day by um, by your staff, but you also prepare more longer term. Sometimes it seems you interviewed Michael Caine. You saw his movie first. You interviewed Jimmy Carter. You read his book first. Yeah. What kind of mix is it for the long-term planning and preparation? Well, if I know someone's coming in, like um, you know, when I interviewed Barack Obama, and and I knew he was going to be coming in, and and so I read his book. I uh, this was when he was a senator, 
and he was just ready to announce he was going to run. He was actually in L.A. to raise money, which is one of the reasons he came on my program, because we have a fair number of, of wealthy donors and who listen. And so he was advised to come on the show. And we had a very long conversation, but I was prepped. I was working on that for probably a week in advance because I was pretty certain he was going to run for president. And I knew he was a very smart guy with an interesting background and that I wanted to ask him questions that would be the kinds of things you would ask a prospective president and for someone who hadn't even announced he was running at that point and who most people didn't know yet who he was at that point unless you really followed politics and you know knew who the junior senator from uh, Illinois was. So Barack Obama and I have both been on your show. Yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and Weird Al Yankovic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, has, has the talk aspect of talk radio changed or evolved maybe even in the last five years in particular? Um, what, what changes have, have you seen in these last this Well, last podcasting has changed everything. I think with the growth of podcasting and the ability to do limited series, to do the kind of production values that I would never be able to do with the small staff that we have, um, is it opens up just a whole other wonderful world of audio. And, and I think there's still, there's always gonna be a place for a live stream of news and public affairs programming, like I do. You'd be listening to it on your phone or your smart speaker or, or whatever other delivery method is to come. It won't be through a transmitter. But I think there's always gonna be a place for that. I think because it's gonna have to be directly supported by the public, it's too expensive to do it with advertising. The budget for a show like mine, even though it's public broadcasting, no commercial broadcaster would pay to do a local show given the costs of mine, just because the people and the labor. Listeners will pay for it because they care for it, they, they, they feel it's such an important part of their lives that they'll contribute five, ten, fifteen dollars a month or more, in many cases, to support it. And and we're very explicit with listeners during our fundraise. We say this is an, a format that's so expensive, so labor intensive, you'll never hear this on a commercial advertiser-supported broadcast. So I think there'll always be a place, and it won't necessarily be public radio, but it'll be a non-commercial entity like a Cal Matters or something like that. And then podcasting that enables there to be that kind of very personal connection on much more niche-oriented topics that people are really into and want to really immerse themselves in. And that's going to take a lot of hours of listening, and it's going to be even more competition for people like me, however long you know I, I work in this business. Uh, I'm competing not just against radio, probably less against radio. I'm competing against Spotify. I'm competing against iTunes and, and podcasts. I'm not really competing against commercial radio and because of the type of program that I do. And it's a whole new world, and we're all just trying to figure it out. The biggest thing is to figure out financially how to do it. Our model is one that others are trying to adopt, that nonprofit news model. but. We've had decades to build that relationship with our listeners, and I think they feel well served. They feel a degree of confidence. Now, Cal Matters, which is a very fine, in my opinion, state nonprofit news site, has a sugar daddy, plus they raise money from their readers. And that's nice. You know, we don't have that kind of a person who's just, you know, the one huge donor for us. But the nice thing too is you don't have someone who's exerting that kind of you know, singular influence on you. But it's, it's gonna be incumbent on these other nonprofit news organizations like Voice of OC in Orange County or Cal Matters to, um, to raise money. And I really hope they're successful. We desperately need that kind of, of nonpartisan, straightforward local news coverage. It's, it's essential to us being an informed electorate. Has the tone become acrimonious, more acrimonious, would you say, in the past five years? 
just because of the partisanship that oh, yeah. we see from Congress down to yeah. the, you know, the media. Yeah, I um, mean, I shared that Joe Pine thing about you know, telling the, the listener, you know, go gargle with razor blades. But, you know, that was kind of part of a shtick. That was, that was shtick. What we got now isn't shtick. It's people who really hold views that people that don't agree with them are morally inferior or reprehensible. And that's made it much more difficult for all of us to converse, you know, with these differences politically. And I, you know, Sometimes people say, well, then you're falling into both siderisms and you're not being. No, I, I believe in, in, you know, calling things as they, they are. You know, if you have the former president saying that he actually won an election he lost, I, I'm not going to say, no, he actually won that election and was cheated out of it. But I'm going to want to hear the people that support him, what they think, what motivates them, why they hold the views they are. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna throw those away because the person that they support is saying something that's just factually untrue. So I I don't have a difficult time walking that line. To me, I, I have great clarity on that. So um, but I wanna hear from I wanna hear from everybody and what they think. Well, we want to hear from people in the audience here, too. I just wanted to ask one other thing uh, uh, beforehand, just on a personal level. Best experience, worst experience? Best interview, worst interview? Uh, one of my f absolute favorite interviews was with an actor. Um, some of you might not be familiar with him. He, he's a comedic actor by the name of Gene Wilder. And he was in a, a lot of... He worked with Mel Brooks, the director, a lot, and... Very funny. Young Frankenstein. Yeah, Young Frankenstein. 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 Yeah. He was a very talented guy. And he wrote a memoir and came on the program with me. And he's someone, and this is not uncommon uh, well, among the general public, but particularly people who, who are funny people, in my experience, often deal with depression. And because uh, a lot of times the comedy was what saved them from feeling socially isolated. They realized they could make people laugh. And it was a way of connecting with other people when they felt like they just couldn't connect with folks. So in the case of Wilder, he came in and I started talking with him about how this all factored into his comedy and what he learned in observing other people based on his own experiences as feeling an outsider and, and the way that public react to him, because he's kind of a reluctant star also. He went so deep in that conversation. He was so open. I couldn't believe it. It was just the time went so fast. And at the end of it, we finished the conversation and, and finished the show. And he turned to me and he said, that is the best interview I have ever had. And we talked then another half hour after that. Just um, It was one of those, sometimes you have in radio, and anyone who's worked in radio any period of time will tell you this, a magic moment where you, it just absolutely, it's like time stops, but, but it's done before you know it. And when you're in that kind of flow, and that kind of experience, it's a powerful thing. I'm sure it's the same way a musician on stage who's just um, in that groove of that performance where, yeah, they may be the greatest musician, but there's that one night in Detroit or you know, where it just all came together. And that's an incredible feeling. My worst, I was interviewing a Caltech Nobel laureate, I believe in chemistry. I thought I was prepared. Oh, man. <laughs> I think I was red-faced for the entire interview. I was so embarrassed. I just, I, I couldn't even understand what he was saying. I was, he, would finish, he would finish his sentence, and I, I was just, I'm sure I looked open-mouthed like, I don't even know what to say. I couldn't, there, I had no intellectual toehold to get in the conversation. So you discovered that thing. Uh, what was that like? Discover, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I tried to keep it as general as possible, but I kept beating myself up even as doing the interview. Like, you're talking with a Nobel laureate, one of the greatest minds in the country, and you, you just you can't even find the way to connect with. So, 
it was a learning experience. And I will never forget that interview. And um, I thought I was prepared, but I wasn't. And I feel now like when I go in to do an interview, I'm never going to be that degree of prepared again. I'm always going to be better prepared than that. It's all about learning. And in radio, you know, the nature of it is you can't, have, you can't perfect anything. It's a series of mistakes. But if, listen, if you're in listeners' good graces and they trust you and that you really are trying to serve them and you're doing your best despite your faults, they're very forgiving. And, and that's the pleasure that I've had with our listeners. They've been incredibly supportive, very forgiving of, of my faults or mistakes that I've made, and really encouraged me to, to, to do the best that I can. And that's, that's incredibly gratifying. Well, it's gratifying to us uh, and many uh, here to be able to see the man behind the voice, because the voice is familiar to many of us uh, here. And uh, we've had a chance uh, to hear, well, tables are a little bit reversed, uh, but uh, to give us an inside look at Air Talk with Larry Mantle. And so uh, having people here to ha have attended AF Talk, not with Larry Mantle, let me finish the presentation with the way that you finish your own shows each time. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that engaging and lively talk. Uh, we will now transition to audience Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you please come up to one of these two mics, uh, give your name and your class year. Thank you. So uh, I'm Richard, uh, I'm a freshman here at CMC. So Mr. Mantle, you were mentioning at the start that uh, AM radio, right, is having this decrease in viewership or in listenership. I was wondering why your show on FM would be able to survive while AM, which is, you know, like historically has like all that more political talk radio has that decrease in viewership. I think uh, part of it is just an age factor that uh, when the FM band became popular, its better fidelity and its emphasis on music led younger people to gravitate to that, and they stayed with FM. So that, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up listening to AM. That was the dominant band. FM existed, but it was pretty fringy. So over time, FM became dominant, and, and the reason that public radio was able to survive on the FM is that the federal government, the FCC, carved out an, uh, the left end of the band, uh, hopefully not symbolically, um, <laughs> for, for uh, all the non-commercial radio to go. And you'll find non-commercial religious radio uh, and, and public radio there. So we had this place where we didn't have to worry about the value of the frequency. It couldn't be monetized because it, these college institutions like Pasadena City College, which ran KPCC, were able to make a claim on the licenses as long as they kept it current, didn't break FCC rules, they could do it. So that, that's what enabled that. Gotcha, thank you. Hi, uh, Mr. Mantle, thank you for the talk. My name's Ryan, sophomore here at CMC. And I was wondering, I think back in the mid-90s, the FCC had that fairness doctrine which required when you brought these controversial topics up to show both sides, at least to some extent, uh, the arguments for and against. And I forget, I, late 80s, they got rid of it. And I was wondering if you would support a similar um, act going into law today or how you think that these really polarized different ends of talk radio can be made less polarized in the coming years? I think that ship has sailed is the problem. I think, you know, back when the Fairness Doctrine existed, you were limited on the number of audio sources that you had. It was just the number of AM, FM stations in your, in your local market. And, and then when they removed the Fairness Doctrine, which mandated you had to have both sides of an issue, that enabled, you know, Rush Limbaugh came around about that time, and they were able to build entire stations on Rush Limbaugh type conservative talk. And it was huge financial success because when you churn your audience, 
uh, when you go from a conservative talker to a liberal talker to achieve that fairness doctrine balance, you lose the listeners, you turn over the audience. That takes away from advertiser loyalty and it costs stations money and listeners. And then listeners are jumping to you know, go to the show on a different station. So it was really the lobbying of the group owners of the radio entities that pushed for this, and television, the same thing. But the thing is now we don't live in the same world. People get their audio from so many different sources that even if you were to reinstitute a fairness doctrine, I think there'd be so much battling over what fair is now. People couldn't, uh, because things are so much more polarized and complicated, I think that would be very difficult. Well, you had this person, but that's not the real side of that issue, you know? And, and um, I, I just think that that isn't going to happen, and I don't think it would be beneficial um, the other thing is it would open even programs like mine up to complaint because we don't keep a record on actual balance. I have, a, I have a sense and the team has a sense of are we treating topics fairly? Are we bringing in diverse guests? Are we hearing from multiple aspects of the community? But that's differently than if we had to document all of that and make a case if challenged that we handled that in the way that really success, you know, that dealt with that. And that's in the eye of the beholder ultimately. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Mantle. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is Nolan Wyndham. I'm a second year at CMC. No. And uh, as an alternative to mandated fairness is uh, the, the option or, or choice for fairness, which is uh, what I think your program presents, which is funded through, through your model of you know, public radio and, and nonprofit news. Um, and so my question is, do you see a, a future for uh, nonprofit news as a, as a more um, widely spread source informing the public? And uh, if so, how do you see that sort of growth happening? How do you see that presentation of, uh, of a more fair and trustworthy option um, being available? It, do you think that you know, there's a breaking point of the divisiveness that comes from um, right-leaning, left-leaning, however, yeah. Um, and do you think that uh, that publicly funded radio or 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 nonprofit news is an alternative? Thanks. I, 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 it's a wonderful alternative. The question, as I was saying yesterday, is the financial model for it. So Patrick Soonchong bought the Los Angeles Times, really not to make money. The paper is profitable, but he, he's a billionaire. He bought it because, uh, well, at least outwardly, as a community service because he, he thought the Times is so important in its local coverage. Now, there may be some other financial advantage for him and the stories they do, whatever, but you have models like that. Even CalMatters has a benefactor who, who gave the money that set it up and now they go with their readers to pick it up. The challenge is whether people will do that. There's so much free content now. Will people do it? The advantage that we have at KPCC is I have a relationship with the audience and I can go on the air and I can, you know, I can explain in a very personal way, here's what your money goes for, here's why it's important. CalMatters can do it in print form but it's not the same as a human talking to you and explaining it. It's not as personal. And these nonprofit news websites are typically viable when there is a big donor or, or, or a foundation that, um, like the St. Petersburg Times, I believe it is, there's a foundation behind it that supports it. And, and so there's an endowment. But if you're just starting it from scratch and you don't have that, I think it's gonna be very, very challenging. I, my hope is that they thrive, we need them. It's absolutely essential and I do think that membership model is the way to go because the advertisers, it, it's just, they're not seeing the value in it. Thank you. Sadly. Hi, uh, my name is Helen. So Hi. my question is pretty broad and also very objective, which I realize. Um, but you had mentioned that you appreciated that the AFT brings in a diversity of speakers and that also you like to hear from everyone. And um, the, I've, I've talked with a lot of people at CMC about this. Um, I think 
obviously the biggest critique to that would be to um, that you're validizing um, perspectives that could be genuinely harmful. And so even in the case that you gave with Donald Trump and bringing in listeners who um, genuinely believe that the election was stolen or genuinely believe that January 6th was justified. Um, so like kind of that idea, but of course across all different sorts of topics, kind of what ex to what extent do you agree that you should limit, you know? The, yeah, no, I, I know exactly where you're going. <laughs> I would not take listener calls on whether the election was stolen. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that because there's nothing to substantiate it. I wouldn't take, I wouldn't take listener calls on alien abductions. Not, not that they may not happen, but there's no, we don't have any, we don't have any objective proof of that. So I'm, I'm not gonna take, you know, listener, uh, but, what I was meaning to indicate, and let me refine what I said a little bit, hopefully, is I want to know what, the, what in their personal life, what, the, what, what they're seeking in the way of assistance from government. What do they want? What do they want in their leader? What do they see as is wrong with America that they want to change? What in their personal experiences have led them to the conclusions that this is the way they think the country should go? So I'm not interested in having them come on and, and speechify and, and, and try and explain to me why their political conclusion is correct. We don't do that. But I do want to talk about issues and hear from those people on education policy, on government spending, on um, uh, race relations. I do, but again, the same way we're not going to put a white supremacist on to talk about white supremacist stuff. We're, we're not going to entertain that because that is corrosive. And, and it, it's, it's putting on stuff like that that um, is, is harmful and demeaning to other people is not the purpose of our program. Does that help answer your yes. question? Yeah, thank you. Also so, to clarify, I meant to say broad and subjective, not objective, but, <laughs> um, but yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Mr. Mantle, thank Hi. you for being here. I'm Noah Swanson, I'm a sophomore here. Um, you mentioned earlier that you found it harder recently to have uh, callers from both sides of the aisle and from you know, every, every viewpoint. Um, since your funding does come from your audience and you mentioned you're serving your audience and money is tight in the radio world, do you think that that kind of economic pressure has led to maybe, has led to that difficulty finding both sides? It can, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following. I'm sorry. Can you restate that? Do you think it's possible that you're, maybe you're, because of the economic pressure from your audience, that your kind of content or who you are calling has shifted so that Oh, that we to respond maintain? to the audience? Yeah, I don't think so because typically our audience doesn't, you know, it's not like advertisers. They don't, they don't put any pressure on us. So, um, and the thing is, if I get complaints about, as, as I have for, you know, why do you bring these conservative guests on? I'm very comfortable saying back, because they're representative of significant swaths of the country. And the purpose of this show is to convene that conversation. And I don't explicitly say, but if you don't want to financially support it, you're free not to support it. But, um, no, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying. Does it become self-perpetuating if you're then serving people? But I think most of our listeners do want to hear from people of different perspectives. I get complaints from some. That's not representative of most, and I know that. So, no, I think, I think we're going to continue to frame topics and to, to convene guests who, pre who present a wide array of, of, of listening. The other thing is that we do have an email address where people can comment. Those skew conservative, which is interesting. And, and this has all, you know, has been the case for like the last decade, that the conservative input comes in written form and people that are more liberal generally call in uh, with comments. And I don't know why that is, but that's, maybe it's because conservatives feel that they're going to be criticized or, you know, which 
you know, certainly is not the case for me, and it's quite the opposite. Um, so, and there's certain segments as well where where I'll say I want to hear from Republicans about your party, blah blah blah, and I'll, we'll only take Republican calls. Similarly, we're talking about the Democratic Party. If you're a Democrat, I want to hear blah blah blah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Simran, and I'm a junior at CMC. Um, and I was wondering, so you mentioned in, with Helen's question how you don't have um, guests that talk about things that don't have any objective proof. So I was wondering for an issue like abortion, would you bring on or like accept callers that have only like purely religious justifications for opposing abortion since there's no objective proof for any of their religious beliefs? No, and I, w I wouldn't. I actually wouldn't do a segment with listeners to make uh, arguments for or against abortion rights because we've all heard those arguments. So I wouldn't, so like the segment I was describing was instead women's personal experiences. And I explicitly said, you know, please, you know, this isn't about, you know, um, abortion rights. I just want to know what the experience was like for you and um, leading up to it in the aftermath, because that was something we could all learn something. But hearing people debate abortion, everybody's heard those arguments, so I wouldn't actually convene that conversation. And if we're talking about a topic like abortion rights, like the Dobbs decision, um, the day that came, we came on the air right after the Dobbs decision was handed down. We took the entire first hour of the program on that. And I asked listeners just to share their feelings about that. And we got a range uh, of, of listener responses to that. Most of them in deep opposition to Dobbs, but that was not the exclusive perspective. But I wasn't asking people to justify why they, this was really a day for people to respond. And that was what I thought was the value on that day to, to do with the audience. Because you know, on a topic like abortion, it has been so debated. We all know where people stand. And I, I try not to go down a road that's just, because that's not interesting for listeners to, to hear that argued again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Sarah. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'll preface with I unfortunately fall in the demographic of young people who don't get their news from public radio, so, which hopefully will change tonight. <laughs> <laughs> which hopefully that all changes, but in case this is like an uneducated question. But I was curious if you could control for the substance and the quality of the news broadcast. Do you think that the mode of radio news versus television news, you touched a little bit on like website written or website news, um, produces like a very different effect, or is it, yes. and why so? Well, and, and I think it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Television news, it's all about the ability of the visuals to move the audience. So as you watch television news or, or online news with a video component, it's all about the clip that's gonna you know, galvanize people and get a strong response. In digital, it's, it's much of it is actually about the quality of the writing itself in sharing the facts that are available multiple places. And so people go to the place where the writing really connects with them, the style, how it's presented. And in radio, it's, it's built on two things, one of which is, well, historically it was the immediacy. Now, because you know our smartphones are, are even more immediate, than radio, we've lost that advantage. But we still have the advantage that you can do other things while you listen. And that's true of podcasting, of course, too. And, and so in, in the kind of stories that we tell, I'm always thinking of the person who's concentrating on driving as they're listening, or who's at her desk working while she has us on alongside. And so I'll repeat things, reintroduce guests, things like that because we're not always getting full attention. And so it is different. Each, each one of um, the mediums that you mention has its pluses and minuses. Thank did you. That, did I get your question correctly? Yes, it did. Okay. I, I guess I was also curious if like in the question, if you think that you affect people, like do you reach people more personally when they're just listening while doing other things versus if they have to sit down and watch something? How do you think it resonates with people differently? That's a really good question. I think it's more um, 
the relationship that people have to the source of delivering the news. You know, am I listening to it on a cable news channel that I really trust and I connect with? Am I listening to it on a public radio program where I, I feel like I have an affinity for the host? Am I reading it in a place where I really appreciate the way that they tell the story? And I, and I, I think it's really subjective. It's about, um, and it, so it, the power comes with that. The power to move people, the power to make people think about things comes with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi there, my name is Charlie Hatcher. I'm a sophomore here at CMC. Thank you so much for your talk tonight. Um, you mentioned earlier about how the fall of the Fairness Doctrine helped bring about this era of sort of loud ideologues, at least on commercial radio, people like Rush Limbaugh. So I'm curious why you think we didn't see liberal equivalents of people like Rush Limbaugh <laughs> yeah. crop up around then, or if they did crop up, why they didn't stick around like folks like Rush Limbaugh did. It's such a great question, and, and one that's been out there for those of us that work in radio for a very long time. Um, it's the same, re why is it documentary filmmaking is almost all liberal? It's, it's, it's like, what, why is it that certain um, ideological perspectives gravitate toward a form? And I don't have, I don't have a good answer. Liberal talk radio, you know, there was a net, whole network called Air America network that had all liberal hosts. And they just never got critical mass. And I think the primary func the primary reason was the hosts really weren't that strong. They were more activist types than they were entertaining and interesting to listen to. The points they were making were all really important. The topics were really serious, but it was like a drudgery to listen to it. And the thing is, Rush Limbaugh, for conservatives, made listening to him fun. Now, uh, liberals don't quite understand that, but, but for conservatives, <coughs> Rush was a very fun and exhilarating experience. The way he made fun of liberals, the way, you know, and he said this, I don't know how much this was true, but he said, um, you know, I'm really an entertainer, I'm not, I'm not a political, I'm not trying to move things politically. I think the more he did it and the bigger his audience got, he definitely bought into that wanting to have a political influence. But I'm not sure he did when he started. That, you know, he, you know that kind of happened with time. Um, but it's still, it's still a big mystery to me. There are conservative documentarians, but if you, when you watch conservative documentaries, it's like listening to liberal talk radio. It's just, it's so didactic or so, you know, um, it, it's just, it's not good filmmaking. For the most, I, I'm painting with a broad brush. It's not generally entertaining to watch. And uh, I don't know why. Thank you. Good question, though. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Ryan. I'm a freshman at uh, CMC. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much uh, for your talk. And second of all, uh, in response to an earlier question, you said that you believe that reinstating the fairness doctrine would probably do more harm than uh, good. And th that, like, the, uh, it's, the ship's already sailed in terms of, you know, polarization in uh, media forms such as radio. So um, do you ever see that kind of changing um, in the future? And if not, what do you think might be the consequences of that? Well, I don't, I don't see it changing because the government doesn't have the regulatory authority over you know, but a tiny percent of what's out there. They have it over you know what I do and those that are on FCC controlled bandwidth, but nothing. You know they don't control social media. They don't control uh, social media platforms. So it, it's um, I just I don't see any way for the government to make a meaningful difference. And frankly even the conservative talk radio world is contracting a bit because it has largely been an older audience and as baby boomers are, sadly I say this as a tail end boomer, um, as we're departing, um, that's taking listeners from those conservative talk shows. I don't know what the long term future is going to be, but um, I, think, I think what's gonna have to happen instead of a fairness doctrine is that a clearly established economic model 
for bringing multiple perspectives together and straightforwardly dealing with them. It's going to have to evolve. And I hope it does evolve. And like um, your, your fellow student was talking about nonprofit journalism, my hope is that that is the vehicle for doing it. Not that I'm against, I'm, I'm a capitalist. I'm not, it, uh, if there's a way to do it and sell ads and make it profitably, that's great. But I think nonprofit journalism is going to be the likely way to do that. Thank you. Well, Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, so I'm Kimmy. Um, I'm a senior at CMC. And this might be a bit of a different question than um, a lot of the other questions that have been po posed. So, um, you know, Desmond, you called in on air um, when he was born, and you were also able to celebrate um, your, the, the memory of your good friend, um, Steve Julian, on air. So what has it been like to, you know, live out these really incredible life events on air and what has been the community response to them? Um, it's really hard for me to put words to it, Kimmy. Um, to be able to you know, be in the hospital room the morning after your child is born and to tell your listeners um, that you're a father and what that experience is like as exhausted as, as Kristen and I were that morning, or far more than me, and I know I was exhausted. <laughs> but. To be able to share that is an incredible experience, or to be able to talk about my my best friend, Steve Julian, who also worked at KPCC and, and uh, who died a few years ago of a brain tumor, uh, all too young, and to talk about him, that was very challenging on the air because it was such a huge loss for me and a loss for our listeners. He was our morning drive time host. So I'm talking to listeners who are grieving this person they've woken up to listening to for years, and I'm grieving the loss of my best friend. And um, you never forget, I, I mean, those experiences I will carry with me forever. But those are a couple of the experiences that I hear back from listeners all the time. There's so, I had someone tonight who told me they heard when Desmond was uh, born on the air. Uh, it was your father, I believe, who <laughs> was telling telling me that he remembers that. I can't believe it was 21 years ago. So it and it helps when people hear the people on the radio going through these life events and experiences and joyous occasions and losses and all those things. It builds a relationship. You know, one of the best things people can say to me is, "I say I feel like I know you," and I think as as Kristen would say, you do. I mean, this, the person I am on the air is me. And um, it's incredibly rewarding to build that relationship with an audience that goes through these experiences that I've been able to share with them. I, I'm incredibly fortunate. I'm really blessed with, with the audience that we have and, and the job that we have. And I, I never forget that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you once again to Larry for joining us tonight, and thank you to the audience for your questions. Uh, have a wonderful evening. We hope to see you again at the F soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been great to be here. Thank you.